Now, what is the process? So obviously, like every other strategy, define your objective. Okay, ask yourself, what is the purpose of the message? And what do you want the recipients to do when they get the message? It's very important to ask both of those questions because most of the time people will ask the first question, what is the purpose? But then forget that there's a follow-up question that says, what do you want your recipients to do when they get that email? So the objective of your message could to have customers to sign up for an event. Maybe you're an e-commerce site, they want to purchase something. Maybe you want them to follow you on Twitter, okay? Uh, make an appointment, respond with some feedback, or check out any new feature you may have implemented on your website or on your app, right? Just some things that we kind of put there as objectives. It could be hundreds and thousands of other objectives you may have, okay? Next come building a recipient's data, that database, okay? Define the target audience who you, who you wish to send the email to, okay? Build the data of that target audience, okay? You can build your own database. So let's say your past customers, the people that have come and signed up for newsletters, et cetera, et cetera. Or you can buy a database. And here, we've indicated not recommended. Not a good idea to go out and buy databases, okay? because that database has been sold to hundreds of others. In likelihood, those people have, are gonna just not like getting an email from you because they're getting it from hundreds of others. Or worse yet, the data might not even be right. Okay, it may just not work. It may not be active email IDs. Uh, we need to email marketing and like, you know, when I go for buying data, I do get uh, like a bulk of data which is at a very lower cost, or even I've been uh, getting people who would tell me like they can give me leads, which is expensive. Like one lead would cost me even 100 rupees, or as compared to an email would be for 25, 25 paise. So how would you differentiate that for us to understand? Again, finding what your objective is, right? What is that lead for? If that's a lead for, let's say, an e-commerce site, then I might be okay paying for the lead, okay? But if you're telling me I'm just trying to create a brand reputation, then I may not want to get that lead. Okay? For me, that 100 rupees is way too expensive. So it all depends on what your strategy is, and everybody's gonna have a different way. Usually, it doesn't make sense uh, for you to go out, buy either one, by the way. Okay? You should be building it yourself in most cases. Okay? Use your social media, okay? use your own connections, then they'll have connections, then they'll have connections, and that will be probably data that is much more useful than the data you're going to get outside, even if it's a lead. But even to start a business, like somebody who does, who is just starting a Facebook page or Twitter handle, I'm just launched my website. So to announce it and to ensure that it's there, and I mean, I mean, that stage would I need to buy a lead or maybe or, or or data maybe? No. Why? You could still go out and today, especially with zero, I can build all thing, everything from the ground up, because in social, I don't need to have a database, right? I start creating posts and I start creating my targets, okay, who I want the post to reach out to, and suddenly you'll reach out to them, okay? So your database will start getting built by yourself. Today, those days are gone where you had to have leads being bought or databases being bought, okay? Again, the amount of time that it will take you to clean it, to find genuine ones, and ultimately execute your whole strategy is gonna take forever, okay? Are you rather? use social and other ways to gather this data. Now, last point I was mentioning anyway, uh, leverage on associates database. So if you have partners, vendors that have databases, you can actually leverage it because at least you know that data is genuine, okay? The data to be gathered. So what are you gonna try to gather? Email ID, obviously, because we're talking about email marketing, right? Their first name, their last name, the gender. Okay, and any other profile information that you would require. Okay, so maybe, maybe, depending on what business you're in, you may want to get other profile information from their date of birth or something else. Okay, but the first couple of things is what you need, your email, the first name, last name, and their gender. Okay, because these things will definitely change 
what messaging you're putting forth. So other data, create a database for the response, okay? So if you want more data, you can create a form, tell them to respond to it and save it all, okay? It's not initially what you need, okay? Also create databases of time sent, delivery sent, delivery time, read time, actions taken. Basically, what it's saying is everything that happens or every process, make sure you're recording it so that your data and analytics are very strong, okay? Because with that, you'll be able, remember those four things? We said we wanna reach the proper person, the proper messaging at the proper time with proper frequency. Well, you'll only be able to do that if you're recording everything. Because if you know how often they're starting to open your email and what times of day, you know what time of day to send it to them now. Okay, so make sure you record it. And most email providers give you this information. Okay, now, how do you create an email content? Or what are the different types um, of elements on an email content, okay? So obviously, uh, email ID for which you're sending the mail, you're gonna need that. All right? These are simple things, okay? Uh, use person's email ID instead of generic email ID. Nobody wants to open an email that comes from contact at something, 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 or info at something, something, something. More personalized email ID it is, the more chances that somebody's gonna open that email, okay? Uh, do not use, do not reply address. This was a thing that uh, a lot of companies use where they would send you an email from something called do not reply at xyz.com. No yeah, or no reply at. That's a bad thing. I mean, large corporates can get away with it, okay? But as a small business, you can't get away with it, okay? Uh, don't keep changing the address because what happens is most people, if they like the content that you're sending them, right, they will probably put you in their favorites or their safe list or whatever, okay, or in their address book. And if they do, then your emails are always going to be delivered to their inbox. But if you decide to change email IDs, you know what? It's going to follow the same old process again, okay? Then... What do you do with the name, okay? You all understand that along with the email ID, the name always appears, right? So make sure it's easily recognizable. Use a person's name, even if it's a company. Always use a person's name to send the email. Now, alternatively, if you don't want to, you can use company or brand name, but it's recommended that you use a personal email, uh, personal name, okay? Because imagine getting an email from a person versus a company. You yourself will be more likely to open one from a person than you are from a company. What other elements? What do we do with the subject, right? This is the subject line. Probably more than the name, the email ID, the subject line is probably one of the most important you can ever think, right? Um, Personalize a message with the recipient's first or last name, okay? If you're able to do that, it's huge. Because in most cases, when you get an email, it doesn't, it's not personalized in the subject line. Maybe it's personalized in the body or whatever comes in the email, but the subject is not personalized, okay? By personalizing it, it increases your open rates considerably. Use different subject lines for different um, campaigns. Don't use the same ones, okay? Try to summarize your content in the subject line. Why should they open it? If you think that they'll open it and then read and decide, no. Most people decide on the subject line if they should open it or not, okay? Uh, keep subject lines short, not more than 50 characters. By the way, why keep it short and not more than 50 characters? Because uh, the person, the recipient will probably not have an attention span that long to keep reading the long emails. Okay, well there is even a more basic reason. Most of our screens are not large enough anymore because we're using mobiles a lot of times to read more than 50 characters. So how do you differentiate yourself? Subject line is a very big area. I'm telling you, most of us 
it's either the subject line that we decide to email, uh, open the email from, or then the sender of it. If it's somebody we know, we'll open it. Or if the subject line is interesting enough for us to open it, we'll open it. Otherwise, we don't. I just want to know, because we are sending a bulk emails, right? How to personalize a message with response first and last name? So that's the reason why bulk emails don't work. So that's why we're saying you have to customize it. Make sure your bulk email program is able to customize it. Because I get, you know, on a day, and I am not joking, uh, between the time I start the class to the time I end the class, even on a Saturday, I'll have some 300 plus email to look at. Are you kidding? What do you think I'm going to look through 300 emails? No, what I'm going to do, I'm going to scan through. I'm going to find the users that uh, I know, people that have sent me, the, peop uh, the people that have sent uh, that I know. I'll open their emails. And the other thing I'll look for is a subject line that I want to open. Otherwise, nothing else. So if you want people to open your email, then you have to make sure the subject line is somewhat customized, somewhat to the topic that they would be interested in. That is true, but how to do that? So almost all um, email software allow you to do that. You just have to program it a certain way. And we're going to look at one very quickly at the end called MailChimp, because that's an easiest one to look at. Um, and you'll see, they'll give you custom fields, and you can put it there, and it'll automatically, bulk-wise, send everybody's first name in the subject. Another few points here. Okay, put key information at the beginning. Make sure, because as the person is reading it, if the key information is at the end, they may not get to read it. Okay, non-ASCII characters, okay? No non-ASCII characters, make sure. Stop putting things that people can't read. Uh, make it unique, compelling, engaging, and actionable. Wow, that sounds like content, All right? Remember content strategy? Sounds like the same words. I think they are the same words, okay? So remember I told you content, we're covering, but we're gonna be talking about it and every marketing step there is, okay? Now, what other elements? We're done with the name, the email ID, the subject. Now comes the message body, okay? Now, something very important. Set a single objective. Be focused on that objective. Because the way people write, they start with one thing, they end with another thing. Right? Let me get five ideas through. You know what? There's one objective. Keep it at that. Okay? Uh, let the content be relevant. Okay? Try nurturing the relationship. Focus on the long term. Don't try to send a message that says, bye now, on an email. Okay, that's good on the website, on an email it's not. Okay, try to see if they have a need, they'll come buy it. But give them a reason why, right? Nurture that relationship a little bit, okay? Uh, maintain optimum image to text ratio. By the way, if your emails have too many images, it automatically goes to spam. That's how it goes. So you have to maintain a ratio between image and text. More text you have, better chances of it not landing in spam. Maintain images to enhance, not deliver, okay? Do not rely on images to deliver your message. Use them visually to support your text. All we're saying in an email, image is not what's supposed to convey the message. Text is. Email is just there as support, okay? Uh, Use web safe fonts, okay? Because what happens is not all fonts are available across all platforms. So make sure you don't use something unique, okay? This says maybe Arial or Verdana, okay? Um, on an email, it's not recommended to use italics. You still want to do it, please do, but it's not recommended. Yes? Mentioned the optimum image to text ratio. Yeah. Um, what methods can we use to find that? Like, how should we think about how to get it? Unfortunately, the way we're discovering is by doing it. Okay, um, because there's so many factors to that image to text ratio. One is the look and feel. Right. Obviously, I want to balance. Second is the size of the images. The actual file size of the images. 
So we're trying to balance the look, the file size, okay? Sometimes a flat image gives me more image to work with versus something that's a complex image which takes a bigger file size which gives me lesser to work with. So it's not a straight out answer. You'll have to see what the image sizes are coming, what is the look and feel looking like, and balance it out, okay? It's just the whole concept is uh, if there are a lot of images or the image sizes are large, it's gonna go in spam, okay? Do you know that likelihood is if there's too much red text, red colored text in your email, it's gonna go in spam, okay? You learn over time. Try it, okay? Because why would you make, so okay, just like Google in email also, uh, and obviously Google is our big email guy now, uh, why would you make text red? What is the reason? But why don't I just underline it or bold it? Why am I making it red? Get, get the attention. Absolutely, and Google says that's not right. Red is danger. Yes, red is definitely danger. Google thinks you have Absolutely, that's how it goes, my friend. That's how it goes, right? So, um, web safe fonts, okay? Um, designed for message preview pane, okay? So what happens is a lot of us see a short form of the message, right? We don't always see the full message. Like if you use Outlook, you'll see three, four lines in the beginning, okay? Even other platforms, I can actually preview. So even in my Gmail account, I can preview before opening the whole message, okay? So the preview is very important. So make sure the preview carries your main message, okay? Review your email in various panes, okay? Columns, wide, classic. Make sure it works across all of them. And lastly, but not least, keep mobile in mind. Because a lot of us today read our emails on our mobiles, not on our laptops and desktops anymore. Forget the people that only have mobiles, even the ones that own desktops and laptops, we're still reading stuff on our mobiles more than anything else. When you mentioned about uh, keep mobile in mind, um, most of the platforms like even social media gives me an option to see how it would look on, on a probably, you know, on a, on a mobile feed or probably if I have a website, I can understand or it's responsive, I can see how it would look on a, um, on a mobile feed. But when it comes to email, uh, how would I come to know like how would it, this email would look on a mobile? It, so now most of the email providers will give you an ability to see a mobile view. Okay. Uh, but again, because there are images and everything, you need to make sure that you properly plan beforehand also. Because if, if most of your customers are on a mobile and they're gonna open it on mobile, your email might as well be structured for a mobile. Emails are not web pages, okay? Remember that. A lot of people like to send an email just like a web page, right? Images and videos and flash and anything else they can put on it, right? So. Just remember that, okay? Give prominence to call to action elements, just like your web page. Make sure call to action. So remember what we said in our strategy? For two questions, not just one. Second question was, what do you want them to do? So why don't we tell them what we want them to do, okay? Personalize the email. And lastly, create provisions to share content through email and social media. So give people an ability on that email to share it on social, okay? But again, I'm gonna go back to that call to action. Make sure you have indicated. By the way, even when you get emails today, most emails will not carry a call to action. They're just not telling you what to do. Ab kya karu, right? That's the question. What should I be doing next? Should I go to the website and check it out? Do I download a mobile app? What do I do? Okay, the call to action has to have prominence and people know that this is what I need to do. So I get an email, I get an email from you. I read it, now what? What do I need to do? What next? That's the call to action. What about a company which is making videos and photographs only? And they want to like, for example, you are a CEO of a company or a market, or your marketing head. And I'm a company which uh, is into making, um, you know, road shows for, or corporate shows for, you know, like, like them, these people. So they want to contact you. So obviously they will have to show that, show you it, uh, the show reel they have done through that email. 
and the photographs they have already clicked in the past. So how would they go about it? So they would have to create some unique way of showing me one photograph on the email and then getting me to click and go see an album somewhere. Yeah. Or they give me a YouTube link or a slide share link. I mean, they have to give me something else than just putting it there, OK? Simple YouTube link also works today, right? <laughs> because when it comes through a YouTube link, automatically I can play it right on my email. Yeah. What about the length of an email? There has always been a debate about some people saying make it longer, some people saying make it shorter. So it should be as big as you getting a message through. Message. How, how long does it take you to get a message through to someone else? So some people are very talkative in, in, in real life also, and it takes them 15 minutes to explain anything, versus some that explain in 15 seconds because they don't come to them. So it's all your thing. How long does it take you to convey the message? The shorter it is, the better it is. Shorter. Absolutely. Like somebody mentioned, attention spans are lower. Right? Second, it takes up my mailbox. And by the way, it's another factor of spam. So heavier the email, more chances going to end up in spam. OK? I'll, tell you, I'll give you a test, very basic test. If your mails are going to spam, send a one-liner to the same email ID that usually your mail goes to spam in. It'll actually end up in the mailbox, even though other mails are going in spam. Because Google actually, Google and others say, you know what, this, may, this must not be spam. What line me kya spam? So they automatically put it. So the shorter it is, the better it is. OK, the footer, the last piece of your email, OK? Uh, ideally, just like your website, it has to have your address, your contact information, et cetera, OK? Uh, you can consider including your social connects if you want to. Or if you've already done it in the body, you don't need to do it again, OK? And most importantly, give provision to unsubscribe. Because like somebody said, what if I don't want to get that email anymore? So give me a provision to unsubscribe so that I can just say unsubscribe and be done. Okay? Clear? So we talked about the headers, we talked about the subject, the name, the email ID, the message, body, uh, and the footer. Okay? Yes? Good to go? Okay, moving on. What is the next marketing process, right, in email? It's actually setting up the campaign. Now, where do we set up this campaign, right? So there's places like MailChimp, Constant Contact, in India, you have Netcore, Octane, and a few others. Okay, these are service providers that provide you email services. Okay, for a price. Okay, for whatever sense, they'll give you each email you can send through them. Now, make sure you set up analytics in place. And again, we'll be talking about analytics more when we get to the analytics module. But remember that set up your analytics in email, because then you'll be able to track everything, OK? Check the links included in the email content, OK? It's not a good thing if you're sending an email with a broken link, meaning the link doesn't work. Check for spams using spam checkers, OK? There are actually spam checkers out there. They will tell you, for whatever reason, are you are, or is your email going to end up in spam? May it be content? It also can be reputation of your domain. Okay? If your domain is identified as a spam domain, then it'll always go to spam. Okay? Set up your recipient's database and dynamic content, such as salutation, first, last name, personalized content. So when you're setting up the platform, let's say MailChimp or whatever, you want to make sure your database has all this stuff set. right? So what, what do you want to use, Mr., Mrs., Master, whatever? right? What is the first name? What is the last name? And any personalized content you want for that particular recipient. You may, you may know the recipients, or they may have told you some personalization they want. So make sure you carry that content. Okay? Schedule the message for the right time. We already talked about it. Part of our four pillars. And then evaluate the results. And these are some of the metrics you will follow and you will measure. How many emails were sent? How many emails of sent were delivered? 
They're two different things. You may be sending 1,000 emails, and maybe 700 are being delivered. OK? Number of emails opened. And then number of actions taken. OK? You have to track all of these. Uh, which tool is providing the uh, analytics of open email? So the email platforms themselves provide it. Yeah. Okay. The other is to use something like Google Analytics and others and integrate it into your email, and they can also provide these kinds of things. But let's say you use a MailChimp or a Netcode. They actually have these analytics. They will tell you what is delivered, what is sent, what is open, and uh, how many people clicked on what link. All of that stuff is available. Plus, there are external tools also that you can track it with. Even sir, same spam checkers is also available in Google Analytics? No. Actually, if you go to Google and just search for email spam checkers, you'll find a whole bunch of them. You put your content in there, your email, HTML content in there, and it'll tell you if it's going to end up in spam or not. What are the chances? Okay. Now, one thing that I think you all should uh, look at is this thing called A-B testing. Right? How many of you have not heard of A-B testing? Okay, basically the concept is that you try two things or three things or four things and compare it to each other and see which one works better. Okay? So let's assume that we send an email with a green background and I send an email with a red background and see which one performs better. Okay? That's called A-B testing. Okay? And you can do A-B testing on the subject lines, on the time of the delivery, the copy, the creatives, the call to actions, almost any element. This is important because in the initial days, you learn what works and what doesn't. And then you can use it going further. So A-B testing basically is taking two, three, four, multiple choices, okay, and using all of them for the same objective, and then measuring which one works. Right? I may send the same email, okay, four different ways, okay? Like I said, very simply, I may change the color of the background on that email for all four and see which one performs better, both in deliveries, opens, click-throughs, and everything, okay? And what works is what I may use going further as well, okay? It's a trial and error, yes. So almost all platforms today will give you the ability to do an A-B test. So for the first campaign, I can do it for the entire thing. Yeah, I would do it for the whole thing. Whichever gives me the best result, then the next campaign, I'll continue with the one yes. which has given me the best result. Yes. All right, sounds good. OK, keep plan ready to manage the response to the emails. So you know what? Email bhejna to sabko aata hai, and it's all fun. But you know what? Have responses ready, because people are going to email you back, call you back, whatever back. You need to have responses. You can't, they don't want to wait days to get a response back from you, OK? Tips to keep mail out of the spam folder. This is a pain point for everybody. Almost all emails end up going to spam, right? All your efforts and money will go to drain if your mail ends up into the spam folder, which, by the way, is happens most of the time. So what do you do? OK, there's something called the Can Spam Act. OK, make sure you're compliant. OK, and here are a few things. Again, these are just guidelines, OK? Don't use false or misleading error information. So don't say the email is coming from the President of the United States. Because that's false information. OK? Or PM Narendra Modi. Right? PMO, Namo, whatever, whatever, whatever. The old Nigerian print scam. Yes, exactly. That's what they used to do. Right? Don't use deceptive subject lines. Same thing. Don't tell people you're going to win a thousand rupees if you open and read what we're telling you or something like that, right? Like we go millionaire and like you, you have won one million dollars, just respond back to us. Ha, so those are deceptive, right? And you're not supposed to be using them. They make me happy actually. I, I become. <laughs> you just need to open the email. Uh, identify the message as an ad. You know, most of us don't want to do this. But it may work well for you to actually tell the people that what they're looking at is an ad. Okay? Um, so on the email, tell people that it's an ad. So if you're sending a promotion, tell them it's a promotion. Don't try to hide it into other things. Huh? So 
Tell recipients where you're located. Tell recipients how to opt out of receiving future emails from you. It's very important. Opt out has to be there. Next is honor opt out request promptly. So if they're sending you unsubscribe, make sure they're unsubscribed before the next email goes out to them. Last thing you want is for them to have clicked unsubscribe, you send another email and you have not unsubscribed them and then they're gonna complain. Okay, and then they go to a social media and write how bad you are. Okay, monitor what others are doing on your behalf. So for instance, you've given others to do emails for you or other things. Make sure you understand what they're also doing on your behalf. So you may follow the rules, but what if they forget? Avoid spam trigger words and phishing phrases. So how else to uh, you know, stay away from the spam boxes, okay? There are unfortunately uh, no complete list of trigger words. I told you that certain times when you write certain things, it automatically goes to spam, okay? Maybe winning a prize, probably. Okay, but there's no list for it, but again, you should not use uh, words that more than likely may end up in spam. Okay. Uh, further, it's not always the case that your email will end up in the spam filter by using a so-called trigger word. So again, there's a lot of factors. It's like Google ranking. How things end up in spam and how not. I told you, you send a one liner in text, and even if it has a trigger word, it may still end up in inbox, okay? Um, like it says, remember that the spam filter, all it's trying to do is remove commercial advertisements and promotions. That's all. That's the job it serves. Okay? And generally, words that are common in such emails should be avoided or used sparingly. Okay? Uh, promotion, get 50% off, buy today. Some of these words may end up in spam for you. If you notice, most of the bigger e-commerce players will ask you to add them to your address book, okay? The reason they're doing it is because they use these words. And when they do, if, you, if they're in your address book, then you'll see the email. Otherwise, it's gonna go to spam. So they run big campaigns to ask you to add them to your address book. Phishing emails are designed to steal your identity, okay? By getting you to click on a fraudulent link. You know, give me your uh, address and maybe your PAN card number and this and that, and you'll win, like that email, okay? So phishing emails, make sure you stay away from those kinds of emails. The most common method for the email is to be disguised as a legitimate email for a service you trust such as a bank or a website, right? You see those emails that you suddenly say, this has come from Google or it's come from my bank, but realistically, it's not, okay? You wanna avoid using phrases that are common on, in those emails also. So look at those emails when you get them, make sure don't use those phrases in your mail, okay? Because that's how uh, email service providers Try to put it in spam. It's a, good it's a good practice to avoid your spam filters, okay? Um, it also covers in the case that the recipient cannot view HTML emails, okay? Usually what happens is if you just send HTML, it may end up in spam. But if you have a text version also of the same email, two things happen. One, it avoids spam. Second is if they don't have HTML or if they're not able to view HTML, they can at least view the text version of it. Do we uh, put this part as uh, as part of the email or do we send uh, the text version as a separate email? So usually what happens is when you're sending it, the email will have a link on top that says to view a text version, click here. Okay. And if they click, they can see the text version of it. You had a question? Uh, uh, why someone sends uh, HTML email like to developers or like uh, why HTML email is sent to? HTML email gives you better ability to design, colors, fonts, everything else. Text is just text, normal, readable text. I'm even talking about uh, the format is just words and all, no? like no, coding language is not used, no? HTML is a coding language, right? HTML itself is a language. 
hypertext markup language. So yes, it is a language and it is coded, but usually the way you create it is in editors. So you don't realize you're coding, but it's actually creating a code in the back. Okay, so when you make something highlight, let's say yellow, or some color as green, what's gonna happen is in the background, it's creating an HTML with coding. Okay, so the coding language is not visible to... Uh... No, no, it's because you're only... Look so that means when, when we're using some uh, colors or when we're using some images, we have to send a uh, like word format also. Yes, it's exactly like word. In the back though, it's creating a whole bunch of code. Okay, use permission marketing techniques, okay? Now, permission marketing is a privilege, not a right. Most of us think if we have somebody's email ID, we have the right to send them an email, right? We don't, it's a privilege for us that we can send them an email, okay? Um, try to get permission of the user while registering or while they're purchasing. You know, we talked about this in content and UI UX also. Right? We get their permission if we can send them an email or not. Use spam checkers before sending your mail. Okay? So here's some services. There's mailing check, okay? spam assassin, and others to check if that email is going to end up in spam. Okay? It also checks your domains at times. Sometimes the email is going into spam not because of the email itself. It may be going because of your IP address. It may be going because of your own domain, okay? Because some IP address are blacklisted, okay? And some domains are blacklisted. Okay, so uh, these are some of the uh, spam checkers that we can actually access, okay? Figure out if our emails will end up in spam. We can also check if uh, there's issues with our domain names or if our, with our IP addresses, right? If they're blacklisted, they may also make your emails go into spam, okay? A lot of the service providers out there, right? They spam, they send it to millions of people and their IP gets blacklisted. If you're also using them, your emails, doesn't matter how good of a job you do, will also end up in spam. So you have to also choose your service provider uh, properly, okay? Now, so uh, is there a way to find uh, my domain is blacklisted or like how would I, so, or is it only after sending it I'll come to know? No, so what happens is um, some of these checkers, if you spam checkers, if you use them, they'll tell you if your domain is blacklisted. They do all kinds of checks, right? The other thing to do um, in case you are blacklisted is to get off the blacklist, okay? Now here, uh, a few places that you can actually check. I think that's the question you asked. Here's a few places that you can actually go check if you're blacklisted, okay? Um, if you find that you are blacklisted, uh, follow up with the website that has blacklisted you, okay? And ask them to help you get off the blacklist. So most cases what will happen is if you spam, Google may, or Gmail may put you on the blacklist. And you can actually go back to them and say that please take me off because whatever reason, right? You may have a very proper reason for getting off the blacklist, okay? Something I mentioned before also, maintain a good text to image ratio, okay? It is usually best to not include images at all. That's probably the best way to send an email. However, if you do include images, here's some tips, okay? One, You've seen a lot of people just send an image only email, right? Don't do that, okay? Every graphic should at least have two lines of text associated. So if you're putting one graphic, at least two lines of text to match it. Again, this is no real number that one to two, but at least this much. Optimize your images the best you can. This way the size of the images goes down. Okay, and use well-formed HTML for email. So don't go out and copy a web page. Usually, you know what a lot of people do? They'll copy a web page HTML and then just edit it and send it. What happens in that case, it's not well-structured. There's a lot of extra things in there that you don't need on an email, and you're not realizing that. But the email, once it's sent to a user, and that user service provider will see that, 
and put you in spam. Sure. That uh, where it mentioned that every graphic should have two lines to match it. Is it yeah. uh, the uh, the content in the graphic or? No, no. This is just a basic. You know, it, it's a, it's one of those things that for every graphic have at least two lines of text. That's all we're trying to say. Not in the graphic. It could be. Uh, yes, outside of the graphic. The contents of the email also will go into the search that we were talking in the earlier Google. Very good question. For example, if I am repeatedly uh, sending some information about a person, a profile, his caliber, uh, his ability to deliver something, uh, will all that go into the checking part? Well, first of all, that can happen if you're using Gmail because then Google has access to it, okay? I have to say that there is some impact if it's in Gmail. One of the bigger impacts is if you click a link. That is, so let's say an email you get and you click a particular link, that site that you just clicked, yes, they will get some benefit, okay? Better to put one small link of our website or related things in the email. Everybody has a link to their website on their email. Then, uh, here are a few other trips, okay? Avoid spam traps, okay? Now, these are email addresses that are flagged by the ISPs as being no longer used by a human. So what happens is, they try to trick you. If you're buying databases, these trap email IDs are in there, right? So what service providers do is if nobody's using that email ID and you keep on sending an email to it, they know that you're spamming it. Because otherwise, you should have known that email ID is not valid anymore. So they call it a spam trap. Second point, because you sent the email to the spam trap, they figured out that there was no opt-in. So let's, let's put it this way. How many email IDs are people using that has something like info at abc.com? Almost no one from info at abc.com would ever subscribe, correct? Because that's a non-human email ID. It's just being used to get information and then it's gonna be sent to a person somewhere. If you keep on sending emails to these IDs, that's where they're realizing that, listen, there was no opt-in, so that must be spam, okay? Um, make sure you use the opt-in process and don't buy a list from email brokers, which is what we already mentioned, okay? If you're buying lists, you're sure to end up in spam, I'm telling you, okay? Avoid large attachments. It's just like pictures, images. Don't put big attachments, okay? Uh, because the bigger the attachment, more likelihood of that email ending up in spam. So it says that you can actually generally uh, include some of these, like your images, right? JPGs, your GIFs, your PNG, your PDF attachments. But as soon as you start attaching your EXE files or your flash files, etc., they're gonna start thinking of you as a spam. Generally, when we send profiles, we always put uh, PPTs or you know, uh, PDFs. Correct. So, and some of them, they are generally loaded with images and you know, so they tend to become heavier. So in that case, how would you suggest? After a certain size, it doesn't matter what you're sending. Unless that person has you in their address book, more than likely it's going in spam. It's just too heavy. Many times what happens, we would have spoken to them and they said, uh, send me your details over mail because that's the first no, part. No, see, uh, one time it's not gonna happen. If you, this is a continuous process. Spamming is not about one time. It's, about, it's a continuous process, okay? Okay, uh, generally you should not send attachments to people on your list who are not expecting them. I mean, that's simple, right? Um, if you need an email, a large attachment, um, it's gonna, Again, uh, we flagged as spam, put it in Dropbox, right? We recommend that just put the attachment in Dropbox, send a simple email saying, please take, you know, download the attachment from Dropbox or whatever you wanna download it from, okay? And if it's sensitive data, then use company's FTP servers to send the files. But don't try to include them on the emails because more than likely it'll just end up in spam.
make sure and your DKIM, your SPF, your sender ID, and your domain keys are set up properly, okay? All I know is that the email server related setups that you have to do, right? This verifies you as the owner of the domains. It verifies that you're actually going to send genuine emails, okay? I would love to know if somebody knows what DKIM stands for. Okay, Google it. Yes, let's Google it, okay? And uh, let, let the whole class know when you find out what DKM and SPF stand for. All right, so what I was saying was those keys actually help the ISP determine the authenticity of the email, okay? So um, if you wanna have your email not considered spam, you at least have to get these things set up properly. Keys identified mail. DKM meaning domain keys identified mail and SPF sender policy framework sender policy framework sure all right still to me the same meaning right <laughs> we set them up and try to prevent our mails from going into spam that's how we have to look at it got it simple so final thoughts first make sure all your campaigns are mobile ready your emails, etc. okay? Secondly, one single objective. Don't go in doing this with multiple objectives. Doesn't work, you're gonna confuse the person reading the email, okay? Optimize the design. You know, make the images smaller, enough text, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, okay? Give before you take, okay? Share valuable information first to prove your value to the recipient. This is about building a relationship, okay? Make sure you're giving enough valuable information back. Quality, not quantity. Never send an email just because. Quality over quantity, okay? Remember this, it's very important, right? Never just send an email just because you said, okay, you know what? Let me connect with all my users today. There has to be a reason. Never stop testing subject lines, call to actions, and the content. So even though in your A-B test, something works, doesn't mean you don't test more options, okay? Because you will realize that this is a continuous process. More you test, more you will figure out what works. Okay, and then watch your metrics. We talked about several metrics, okay? Make sure we're watching those metrics, okay? This brings us to the end of our email marketing, okay?